But as you already learned about God's miraculous intervention in conquering Egypt, remember Egypt was the world empire in power during the ancient times. And then the Lord, he rubbed dirt on Egypt's face because remember Nimrod and Semiramis' Babylonian system was very rampant. Egypt was the prime kingdom that carried on and exemplified the Babylonian Nimrod Semiramis power. And the Lord finally cast judgment on the power through the ten plagues upon their ten Egyptian gods and then showed that, hey, the civilization of Genesis 6 and the Nimrod Babylonian system is folly compared to what the Egyptians considered as an abomination, a shepherd's staff. It was all through a shepherd's staff through Moses that the Lord uh, won ultimate glory against the, the empire of Egypt. Now I'm going to show you another very interesting empire. And you got to understand that the children of Israel, when they left Egypt to uh, conquer the promised land in Canaan, the Lord picked that location for a very good reason, and the devil picked that location for a very good reason. Because we're going to soon, soon very much cover that Nimrod's Babylonian system, the best country you want to go to that spread it was the promised land where the children of Israel was going. The Lord picked that land for a very good reason. But we're going to cover some interesting things. Let's continue on. As you might recall, animal sacrifice continued from the Edenic. It started all the way from the Edenic dis dispensation. From Edenic, Noahic, as we look through our dispensations, and Abrahamic, do you remember blood animal sacrifice? Absolutely. Absolutely. So within these covenants that God made with Noah, Abraham, and etc., there was always blood shed, animal blood. So God really valued, you've got to understand this, that the Lord, he very much valued animals, the blood of lambs. That's very important to understand. Every dispensation about the blood of lambs, animal sacrifices, animal sacrifices. So the blood of lambs continued throughout all dispensations. Now, what about the time of Moses now, the Mosaic dispensation? You've got to understand this, that during the time, ever since after Abraham, there was a hiatus of Animal sacrifices, you rarely see that. So there was no lamb sacrifice for literally hundreds of years, especially when the children of Israel was exposed for centuries to the Babylonian worship system in Egypt, the Genesis 6 civilization in Egypt. That's all they were exposed to for centuries. So the Lord, he wanted to bring them back to the importance of the blood of the Lamb. Why? Because pointing out their Messiah in the future. The Messiah in the future. So it is important to understand that when you witness to Jews, the best way where you can witness to Jews is to bring up, well, why bring up animal sacrifices? It's pointing to something, a key thing, redemption, forgiveness. They had to put their faith in the blood of animals as part of their salvation, you got to understand, during the Old Testament, this be reinstated. So let's look at Exodus chapter 12. And then we're going to look at verse 3, verse 3, Exodus chapter 12. And then we'll read verse 3. Now, the last time we read about animal sacrifices before Moses brings it up is Abraham giving up his only begotten son. And then he said a very important verse, God shall provide himself a lamb. God himself the lamb. Why? Because God himself will be the lamb sacrifice. That's what the Lord was showing in the future. And that was the last thing that you could probably find concerning about animal sacrifice until we reach again Exodus Chapter 12, so then the Lord, he wants to reinstate it again. Verse 3, speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying in the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. Now notice that verse 3, it says 
a lamb. You see that? Now look at verse 4. And if the household be too little for what? The lamb. And then verse 5, it says what? Your lamb. Now that would make a good sermon. And there were several preachers that created sermons out of this. It goes a lamb and then the lamb. But is he now your lamb? Your personal lamb. So you notice that when it talks about lamb blood sacrifice, there's a special significance in that, that the Lord emphasized, that was carried. When did that start? Eden. Why did it start? Why did it start? Remember, Adam and Eve, when they partook in the fruit, the fruit that they ate was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then that was what? It was grapes. I don't know if you remember that, so I'm not going to explain why on this study because I already covered previously before. But if you look at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they ate the blood of grapes. They ate grapes. That was the fruit. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ, why did he say that his blood had to be represented by what? The blood of grapes, right? The blood of grapes. Why? Because... He, was bring, uh, he symbolized with the blood of the lamb, and he had to use grape juice to symbolize his blood. Why? Because they had a wrong blood system that time. It's interesting, as soon as they ate the fruit, that's when sin passed upon all generations. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man uh, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So it happened as soon as they ate the fruit. So, there, why do you think, remember, at Genesis, as soon as Noah's flood happened, what did God say? If you shed man's blood, by that blood, man's blood must be shed. Why? Because blood was corrupt. Later on, when we read the law of Moses, what did God say? You cannot eat blood. Why? Because the world's, t the world's blood, the world's blood is corrupt. You need innocent blood. That's why God said specifically an innocent, spotless lamb. Because he wanted innocent blood. But the book of Hebrews chapter 10 says that's perf the lamb skins, even though you make it as spotless as you can, innocent as you can, it's not perfect blood. Until Christ shed his perfect blood, Hebrews chapter 10. So that's why it's very important to understand that blood is essential to understand throughout the entire Bible. The entire Bible, throughout all dispensations, blood is carried. That is very important to understand. So Satan, what does he want to do? He wants to corrupt that blood. Genesis 3, he started it by partaking in the fruit. During the uh, Noahic times, violence. The Bible says in Genesis 6, violence. There was bloodshed. Cain offered up, sacrificed not innocent lamb's blood, but fruits and vegetables. Hey, remember the fruit? In the Garden of Eden, God did not want that. Cain shed human blood. That glorified the devil. That's why the Bible says that the book of 1 John, say Cain was of that wicked one. Because why? He slew his brother Abel. That's what the verse says. So when blood was shed, Satan wants to uh, make sure that plenty of wrong blood was shed. Why? Because he knew the value and significance of God's blood. And Satan, he put that on a hiatus in Egypt. He put that on a hiatus in Egypt. He didn't want the lamb sacrifices to be carried. And Moses mentioned that we have to continue the sacrifice. Look at Exodus chapter 8. Go to Exodus chapter 8. Exodus chapter 8. And notice what Moses says. He says that we got to continue the animal sacrifices because the Lord's uh, anger is upon us. The Lord's anger is upon us. So we got to continue to sacrifice. Uh, let's look at Exodus chapter 8. And then we'll read verse 26. Verse 26. And Moses said, it is not meet so to do, for we shall sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians to the Lord our God, Lo, shall we sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians before their eyes, and will they not stone us? We will go three days' journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to the Lord our God as what? He shall command us. 
28, Pharaoh said, I will let you go that ye may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness, only ye shall not go very far away and treat for me. But uh, the Lord does not want that. The Lord, he wants the sacrifice to be uh, sent out outside of the land of Egypt. Why? Because Egypt was abomination in the eyes of the Lord. Uh, Egypt uh, contained that Babylonian system, remember? So God did not want that. He wanted them to get out of there, and that way they can continue the sacrifices away from the land of Egypt where he commanded them to go. Where he, because why? Because he wants them to continue the animal sacrifices outside of a pagan land. Outside of a pagan land. Let's look at Exodus chapter, we're going to look at chapter 6. Chapter 6. Uh, chapter 5, excuse me, chapter 5. Exodus chapter 5. And then we'll read verse 3. What, what is the first thing? They mention, let my people go. Why? Here's the very first reason why. So you got to pay attention here. This is why they had to leave Egypt. God did it for a reason. Verse 3, and they said, the God of the Hebrews had met with us. Let us go, we pray thee, three days journey into the desert and sacrifice unto the Lord our God, lest he what? Fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. Now look at that, see? So notice over here that God, he was already building up wrath, and he's not happy that they're staying in Egypt. He wanted them to get out so that they can continue blood animal sacrifices. See, Satan wants to keep corrupting that. He wanted to keep corrupting that. So remember the blood of the lamb. That is extremely important to remember throughout all dispensations, and pay attention to how Satan tries to corrupt it. How does he try to corrupt it? He, uh, there's murder. Human blood sacrifices. The Catholic Mass continues. And they say that this is literally the blood and body of Jesus Christ. When it's not, it is something that is shed that cannot be a continual sacrifice. Hebrews 10. So it is important to understand that Satan, uh, from all dispensations, even today, tries to keep corrupting. God's system of how he wants innocent blood sacrifice, pure blood sacrifice, how it should be. And Satan would try to ruin every uh, detail of it. Why? So that he can ruin God's way of doing sacrifice. We're going to look at Numbers chapter 33, verse 52. Numbers chapter 33 and verse 52. Now, during the evolution of language... A lot of people don't understand this, but if you actually go to the Egyptian museum over here, they're going to show you, remember, what's the most ancient culture recognized by traditional history is Sumeria, right? Remember that? Sumeria is the most ancient civilization, human civilization that you'll find. Their language during that time was what they did in pictograph forms. Their language in communication was pictures. But throughout time, it's very interesting if you go to this uh, Egyptian museum here at uh, the area of San Jose, that they showed this evolution of pictures turning into smaller pictures, into certain lines and letters. Now, there's a person who gave a very, very interesting statement. So this is what he believed and he taught. The, the guy's name... He's the Aleph Center for Jewish Studies in Paris. His name is Mark Elaine Wachnin. I think that's how you pronounce his last name. Now he's, now, he's an authority in Jewish studies. This is what he claimed. He claimed that how we get our alphabet today, a lot of people will attribute it to Phoenicia. Now, you notice I have Phoenicia over here. That's going to be very important play later on. Uh, traditional historians attribute to the Phoenicians. But this guy believes that it was actually the Hebrews, the Jews. Now, you might say, why? You know why? Because when God gave the original Ten Commandments, the second commandment was, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. So Wachnin claimed this. He believed that because the Jews took it very seriously not to have any kind of image form, that that's the reason why they switched it to a letter form. And then all the other cultures and civilizations copycatted after that. Now, 
if you read your Bible, when God wanted to, them to get rid of the images, this is very interesting. There are modern Bibles who would change this word into images rather than what your King James Bible says. The King James Bible says this. Look at Numbers chapter 33, and then we'll read verse 52. The Bible says over here, Then ye shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you, and destroy all their what? And destroy all their what? Molten images. Notice pictures is the same line as images. Now why did God say pictures? Because God knows that there are people not just worshiping images, but like uh, the Catholic Church, they'll have what they call icons. Icons. See, that's what the Lord, he worded it very specifically because, remember, now remember this, that's the Canaanites, right? Numbers 33, 52. The Canaanites, I'm going to give you a little hint later on, their worship system is Babylonian. Remember, which religion today is known as the Babylon Church, or Revelation 17, 18 calls it Mystery Babylon, yeah. the Catholic Church. But then it mentions about here that when they took this Babylonian religion from Semiramis Nimrod, it was what? They used pictures. They used pictures. Isn't that interesting? Of course your Bible is so boring and you can't get anything out of it. You know, when you read Numbers 33, 52, you're like, oh, okay, pictures, big deal. You know? That book is amazing. What did I say? That book will blow up your mind every single time. It's a fascinating book. It's a fascinating book. Unfortunately, it's sad a lot of churches don't study the scripture because there is so much gold, so much gold that you'd be amazed when you read out of that King James Bible. It's so fantastic. It's spectacular. Now, here are some uh, evidences concerning about ancient uh, history with Moses and with the land of Egypt. So here are some s historical records. Now, it is so interesting. It is intensely enjoyable when you read about ancient Egyptian history. They do record about these Jews. But when you read their history, it's negative. You can imagine why, right? Because they suffered 10 plagues. They lost their firstborn children, and they lost their pharaoh and all their military might at the Red Sea. So when they wrote about these Jews, you can imagine that they wrote a lot of negative things. The Impuer papyrus, that's I-M-P-U-W-E-R, papyrus, it mentions, it laments about the rivers that turned into blood and that there were indeed desolation in the land of Egypt because of the plagues. So because of that historical records, uh, it is so hilarious when you read about how liberal scholars try to justify this. So they will say that they will try to give natural scientific means on coincidentally why there, there was a swarm of locusts, a swarm of frogs, and then rivers turned into blood. And it is hilarious when you read their explanations and you can tell that this is beyond the fantasy of an imagination. Just like they try to explain the resurrection of Jesus, uh, one of the infamous theories is that he swooned on the cross. He didn't really die. Well, you're really stretching it. You're really stretching it. So that's the reason why it's very hilarious. When you have that much faith in science, naturalism, and you, and you believe truth is only involved in the naturalistic world, then you really have to stretch natural means to explain historical, actual accounts on what happened. So when they talk about the plagues, how do you go around that? The only way you can go around that is stretch it if you only believe scientific natural means as the explanation. There's a, in 2003, there was an Egyptian university professor whose name is Dr. Nabil Himli, and he said that, uh, that the Jews should be forced to make reparations. Why? For all the gold and valuables that were allegedly looted by the Jews when they left the land of Egypt. You know why? Because the Bible says the Egyptians spoiled the Jews. You know why they gave them the valuables? They wanted them to leave. They're like, please leave. You need stuff to go? Here it is. Take the spoils and go. Besides, the Jews, they, uh, it's, they don't have to make reparations. They went through centuries and needed payback. Centuries of slavery. They needed payback. 
So some other interesting things <coughs> concerning about uh, secular scholars is uh, you want to understand that with the Red Sea parting, it is just absolutely ridiculous how they would try to justify on the explanations on how the Jews crossed the Red Sea. So then they mention about, now this is infamous, sadly, throughout most of Bible maps. So I don't know if you have a Bible map, but I want you to look at that one if they mention about the Exodus crossing. And then obviously, if it's your Ruckman reference Bible, it's not going to make that mistake. <laughs> but if it's a different uh, Bible, unfortunately, they make the mistake of the Jews crossing what they call the Sea of Reeds. Do you know why they say that? Instead of the actual Red Sea, they put it as Sea of Reeds because the reason why is that way it's shallow enough for them to cross. Because they don't believe it's a huge miracle where there were two huge, literally sea, Red Sea, okay? It's that deep that was this tall and then drowned out all the Egyptians. Now, this person, I have to mention his name because he's mentioned throughout archaeology and history. And then uh, onliners, they trust me to give the whole truth, nothing but the truth. So whether it's popular or not, I have to say it. But the, this person's name is occasionally mentioned throughout archaeology and history. His name is Ron Wyatt. Ron Wyatt. Now, he has a lot of interesting stuff when you look it up online. He claims that he found one of the chariot wheels where uh, the Egyptians supposedly drowned in this area. Now... My conclusion with Ron Wyatt is this, is that some of them could be true, some of them could be false, but to me, I don't really go for this guy. I, that's my advice for you, and that's actually good advice. Now, you might say, why? The reason why is this, is that, uh, one, he actually corrects the King James Bible, because he'll mention that it's not actually this location. I think it was for Noah's Ark, so someone can correct me if I'm wrong. So it's not actually this location as your King James Bible worded it. It's at a different location, so he corrected it. So that's a red flag to me. If you correct God's word, that's a red flag to me. If God says this is where it took place, it took place over there. The second thing that troubled me was that he claimed he found the Ark of the Covenant because he saw these two shining angels, and then he followed them downstairs somewhere and then found the Ark of the Covenant through that means. Now, you know, Bible-believing Christians, New Testament dispensation, what is our dispensation? Paul says, we walk by what? Faith, faith not by what? Faith. Sight. This dispensation is faith alone for salvation. Christians survive by faith. The only object that we have that's tangible is faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the what? Word of God. Visions, dreams, and signs, you gotta understand that was the beginning for the Jewish people. It was for the Jews. So now that we're at the time of Moses, you know when uh, a lot of uh, people who go to different churches that are charismatic, non-denominational, etc., when they get into signs and wonders, they don't realize this. Do you know when the first sign is mentioned in your Bible? It's Exodus. Go to the book of Exodus, chapter 3. Exodus chapter 4, excuse me. Exodus chapter 4. That's the first time sign is mentioned in your Bible. Do you know why? It was for the Jewish people. Because it was for the Jewish people, they require it. Why? Because they will not believe. But we don't believe according to signs. We believe based on what? The word of God. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. However, Jews, when they believe, they require a sign. Why do you think Jesus said at John chapter 2, except you see a sign, you won't believe? Why do you think Paul, who was speaking to New Testament Christian churches, said at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Jews require a sign? Okay, so let's look at the book of Exodus chapter 4, verse 1. Moses answered and said, but behold, they will not believe me. See that? Nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. And then the Lord, what does he said? Uh, throw down the rod, right? Then it becomes a serpent, hand inside the cloak, and then becomes leprosy, and then he gets it back again. Verse 8, And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the what? First sign. First sign that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. That's the first time sign is mentioned in your Bible. Why? Because Jews require a sign. 
Why don't we believe in signs anymore, Pastor? Because if you know your Bible, God said, because the Jews kept rejecting the gospel, God says, okay, so then we, we give up on you Jews and turn to who? The Gentiles. That's why the nation of Israel, Jerusalem, was lost for over a millennia until 1947 to 1948. Why? Because God was done with the nation of Israel. He was using the church. And in the church, there is no Jew nor Gentile. Everyone is one in the church of God. He doesn't go by nationality. However, in the Old Testament, he was very, very nationally selective. He said only the nation of Israel. Man, he's a racist. He's a bigot. Well, that's how God did it during the Old Testament. In the New Testament, it's totally different. No nationality, no racism, etc. It's what? It's the Christian church. Now they accu accuse you of still being discriminatory religiously. <laughs> See, so whatever you, whatever, basically they'll accuse you of discrimination based on who God chooses. Basically, when God chooses something, I want this for my glory. Everybody says, no, what about me? And God says, no, I want this one. Then they'll accuse God. You're a racist. You're a prejudicious, you're a prejudicial bigot. They wouldn't dare say that, right? Because why? Because then it would be blasphemous. So they put the, the pressure on us, don't they? Yeah. They put the pressure on us, see? So we got to understand that fact. We got to understand that fact. We lived in this uh, day and age, modern century of liberalism and watered down churches that all of this information is so new and shocking. And even some of this is like, I never heard of this before. That's the reason why we need Bible preaching to open up eyes. That's why pastors are held accountable. If they don't teach this kind of stuff, we're going to remain in the machinery of this world. And you can't blame the people if they don't know this stuff. So we're held accountable, right? That's why I have to teach this stuff, even if it's controversial. Why? Because that way eyes can be opened. Because you never heard something like this before, before perhaps. All right, now some uh, more interesting things. So then the Lord showed a lot of signs in the land of Egypt. And then just be careful of this guy. I would just say, you know, look, if you want to, whatsoever is not a faith is sin. So if you just want to play it safe, just look at the Bible. That's it. Just look at the Bible. Uh, I also want to give another uh, disclaimer is that when I was at my school, Pensacola Bible Institute, they really did not like Ron Wyatt. Just a heads up to some Bible believers who don't know that. Yeah, so some Bible believers might be shocked, but yeah, I mean, the school that I graduated from, Pensacola Bible Institute, they really don't believe in that. So they, uh, they, they went through every situation that Ron Wyatt discovered, and then Pastor Donovan would explain, uh, archaeologically speaking and scripturally speaking, why it's wrong. And I had papers this stacked high on that one. I didn't realize it would come important. On, I was like, oh, okay, so what? And then later on, 10 years later, I was like, Oh, this is all over YouTube. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. Some more interesting information. Let's return to China. Let's go back to China now. Now, remember, China, they were a conglomeration possibly of both Ham and Shem. If not Ham, then it's definitely from Shem. And I've proven to you from scriptures. Now, this is from Frederick... Uh, Widowson's book, A Bible Believer Looks at World History, page 42. I'm going to read how he gives the beginning of the civilization of China and onward. China is a very interesting kingdom that you want to study ever since the BCs. And then the Bible rarely mentions it, rarely mentions it. So that's the history you want to uh, study, which is intensely interesting. One belief of the origin of the Chinese was about the first man named Pan Ku, after working for 18,000 years to make the universe, finally accomplished the task at 2,229,000 BC. As he worked his breath, became the wind and the clouds, his voice became the thunder, his veins the rivers, his flesh the earth, his hair the grass and trees, his bones the metals, his sweat the rain, and the insects that clung to his body became the human race. Now I want you to pay attention to the Chinese account of Genesis. You'll notice there's a copycat, a mimicry, because as all pagan mythologies do, of the Bible. You're going to see a creation account. Then you're going to see a Genesis 6 account. Then you're going to hear like a um, post-Genesis 6 account of kingdoms and civilizations building up, but they claim they learned it from the gods, from deity. And then I mentioned that to you before during Abraham's timeline, Shem's timeline, Nimrod's timeline. There was something going on over there. 
And then you'll notice the deterioration of technology and civilization. It deteriorates. You know why? Because of the rarity of the sons of God and their genealogy. And I'm going to explain later on, that's why God wanted them to wipe out the remnant of the giants. Why? To make it more rare. All right, but just pay attention to the Chinese mythology, and you'll notice this decrease, okay? You'll notice this decrease. So we start out with creation. The earliest kings, so it was, was Panku first, then he are supposedly the next kings. The earliest kings, the Chinese said, ruled 18,000 years each. So they had this much life in them and struggled hard to turn Panku's lice into civiliza uh, civilized men. Before the arrival of these celestial emperors, the people were supposedly like animals, eating raw flesh and knowing their mothers but not their fathers. So this sounds like Genesis 6 account, you notice here? As if there's a half animal, half human. This sounds like the Genesis 6 account where I mentioned to you before, there's this mingling of sons of God, mankind, and animals. Now, I've already explained that thoroughly last time, so I'm not going to explain it here. So if you think that's crazy for now, then I guess it's crazy for now, because I don't have time to explain that, because i got to keep going. That was previously on my other discipleship video. But notice that they were supposedly ruling 18,000 years each. But then later on, the Chinese kingdoms and emperors, it shrunk down the years. Because Genesis 5, how long did they live? Th uh, they, they were living for like, uh, hundreds of years, right? So there is this uh, longevity of life. There's this longevity of life. So notice that um, in the Genesis account, there's a longevity of life, but the years shrunk, right, after the flood. So that's what it looks like over here. It's like repeating the Genesis account, except it's just giving different numbers and older dates. Then came Emperor Fu uh, Si, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, who with this queen taught human beings marriage, music, writing, painting, fishing with nets, the domestication of animals, and the feeding of silkworms. He appointed, he appointed Shen Nong upon his death, who introduced agriculture. Then Huang Ti, whose reign lasted only a century, rather than thousands of years, introduced the magnet and the wheel, built the first brick buildings and the first observatory. Yao was such a good ruler that Confucius, we all know the famous Confucius, lamented that there was a golden age during his reign that China had fallen from over the centuries. Shun created the calendar and standardized weights and measures. You, a great engineer, mirrors the great embanker of Egypt fame who saves the Chinese from floods and establishes the Qixia or first civilized dynasty. The Emperor Chie makes 3,000 Chinese jump to their death in a lake of wine. Cho Hing, inventor of chopsticks, brings the dynasty to an end. So you all can thank Cho Hing <laughs> if you're all using ch chopsticks today. <coughs> Western invaders founded the Cho dynasty, which overthrew Cho Hing. What is clear is that the feudal states that developed arose from isolated agricultural communities each week one being absorbed by a stronger neighbor until a handful fought for power. According to ancient tradition, before the Chao dynasty was the Shang. One of the Shang emperors, Wu Yi, was an atheist who defied the gods, blasphemed the spirit of heaven, played chess with it, eventually being killed by a bolt of lightning. Now, this is very interesting. So, his lot's two Babylons, mentions about the Chinese mother and child. Quote, in his two Babylons, the name of Xing Mu applied by the Chinese to their holy mother, compared with another name of the same goddess in another province in China, strongly favors the conclusion that Xing Mu is just a synonym for one of the well-known names of the goddess mother of Babylon. Gleshbi, in his land of Sinim, states that the Chinese goddess mother or queen of heaven in the province of Fujian is worshipped by seafaring people. Okay, now remember this. Seafaring people played a part of Babylonian religion. That's going to come in handy later on. But just remember that. You can guess which region. Now, we'll come back to that later on. Uh, we're at China. And then we now reach toward the Shang Dynasty era.
I'll go backwards later on. But let's keep reading for now. Hislop continues reading over here. Uh, is worshipped by seafaring people under the name of uh, Matsupo. Now Amatsupa signifies the gazing mother. And there is much reason to believe that Shingmu signifies the same. For Mu was one of the forms in which Mut or Maut, the name of the great mother, appeared in Egypt. That's found in Busen's vocabulary. Now I'm still reading from Hislop's Two Babylons. And Xing in Chaldee signifies to look or gaze. Now, you know who was in shock when they saw this Xingmu, the Chinese mother and child? The Jesuits, when they traveled to China for their mission work, and they were shocked oh, yeah. to see a mother and child figure. Babylonia, see? So China was carrying Babylon's religion. It was carrying Babylon's religion with them. You notice what else they were carrying? It's not just the Babylonian religion. It's the Genesis 6 civilization. You notice that? They were carrying the Genesis 6 civilization. You notice what they were doing is not much different from what Egypt was doing. Did you notice that? Egypt was doing their own discoveries, their technology as well. A lot of people wonder how, where did they get the knowledge from. Remember, I mentioned to you before, one Genesis, uh, if you go to nearly every mythology, they claim that they got their knowledge from the gods. All traces to Genesis 6. Sons of God were ruling over all the world, <coughs> taught them their civilization and knowledge, and that's what they tried to build up. They lived longer years, and then after the flood, the years shortened and the knowledge shortened. Uh, during the post-flood period, they were able to make this kind of discoveries in civilization and technology. Why? Because they were carrying the knowledge from pre-flood. And now all of this is getting more lost, and it's becoming more rare. Now, for China's history, here's the summary so far. So we see over here that for their history, it goes from Panku. They claim he's the first, uh, first one. Then it goes down to celestial emperors after that. Now notice, okay, I hope you're paying attention to these words over here. Notice this is repeating the Genesis 1 through uh, the Exodus account. This is repeating the Genesis 6 civilization and the longevity of years and where it was shrinking. Then it goes from the celestials who claim to re, uh, rule about uh, 18,000 years each. They also mention about mutants, which I mentioned to you before. They believe they were half animal, half human, right? Before. And then it hits the uh, early emperors and then Shang. And during the Shang time, this is post-flood knowledge. Over here, we see Genesis 6 knowledge. So here's something to understand. This is probably what was going on during Genesis 6. In China, this is what they were doing. And then during Abraham's time, Nimrod's timeline, this is what they were doing. So that's China. And you're going to uh, see that nearly every nation, pagan mythology you read, you're going to see this kind of structure. It's a Genesis 6 civilization and a Babylonian system. Those are the two things you want to remember. A Genesis 6 civilization and a Babylonian religion. That's what all nations have carried. Now let's read some more things concerning China. Widow Song keeps saying at page 51, so now we're in page 51, the Shang dynasty in China, that's where we're at now, right? Shang Dynasty in China has just recently conquered the Shao at the Battle of Mingqiao, and the Shao are eliminated. It is about this time that the Shang Palace complex at Anyang, China, is built, and for the next 400 years or so, all the palaces of the Shang will duplicate this. The Shang also developed a system of writing in pictograms, similar in type to Sumerian cuneiform, an Egyptian Hieroglyphics, a stylized picture strung together to form ideas. Remember, before the Hebrews, if that 
if Wagner is right, did their, uh, if they were the ones who first introduced the letters before then, it was cuneiform, it was hier hier uh, hieroglyphics, it was pictogram form of writing. And the Chinese had that back then. So notice China is a very huge power, a very important power to remember during the earliest BCs. They're the ones that go way back to Genesis, China. That's how powerful this kingdom is. As a matter of fact, there's uh, still debate among scholars whether Korean in their, Korea in their ancient kingdom, it was independently formed or they were copycatting a lot from Chinese. Why? Because China was all over. In fact, even Japan's earliest BC kingdoms, uh, a lot of it was from China. China is a, big, uh, is a big power during the BCs. That's why Satan pays very special attention to that during end times. The Bible says, remember Revelation 16, what the kings of the east might be prepared. And the numbers of that only match up to China. And if you look up current events in COVID-19, you know which nation everyone's looking at and they're scared of following. See, it's a big place. It's a powerful, it's a powerful empire. Now let's talk about the different kingdoms. Let's talk about worldwide now. In this relative time period of around 1500 BC, traditional historians tell us that the Aegean volcanic island of Thera explodes, bringing an end to the Minoan civilization on Crete. The resultant power vacuum allows for the expansion of both the Myc Mycenaean of Homer's Iliad and Odyssey as well. So notice uh, ancient Greece. Remember I mentioned to you that's where the Philistines came from. All right, now I'm not going to cover that, all right? But during this time, remember I mentioned that they had some kind of uh, cataclysmic event that happened that tied to Venus, which was very interesting, the Venus deluge, etc. Some interesting things going on, and that's where the Iliad and the Odyssey copycatted. If they did not copycat from Noah's flood, then they would copycat from that time where something happened. Because the sons of God, they were just doing something. Now, I'm not going to repeat that. That was a lot of interesting stuff in the last discipleship. But it looked like the sons of God, they were trying to do some things that connect heaven to earth. Why? Because Nimrod was doing that. He was connecting somehow heaven to earth. Now today, what is mankind trying to do? They're trying to c connect heaven to earth. With Elon Musk, what he's launching, and all the world, what they're doing. All right, anyway, I'm not going to waste time on that one. That's a whole nother story, all right? And you thought that the Bible doesn't have this many golden nuggets, did you? <laughs> There's so much stuff. All right, now let's talk about the ones that I was so excited about in this discipleship. And then we're going to close it with them. And then we'll talk about the other, uh, other stuff later. Phoenicians. They're the ones I wanted to talk about. So notice over here, Phoenicians, they're mostly around the area of Lebanon during that time. But actually, that's not. So this is mainly where you can find a lot of their kingdom, their main kingdom. But to be quite honest, that's not where, uh, it's not only here. They were independent, uh, independent communities being formed almost world, uh, across half of the world from Phoenicia. You know how far they covered? They covered... You know why? Seafaring. Seafaring. Now, you notice this is close to which land where the Jews are going toward? Canaan, the promised land. Ready to lose your socks on this one? Didn't you, you know what? Uh, Snell's life in the ancient Near East, according to his work, the word Canaanite, you know what it was synonymous with? Merchant. Now, I don't know if you knew this. If you want to spread culture, different beliefs, religion, values, it was through being a merchant. Because merchants travel, and then they'll carry the merchandise, the writings, the materials, the values, the beliefs, the idols, all around. So this worship system was spreading around. You know who their chief gods are? Phoenicia. So this is found in your map, actually. If you look at your uh, Bible charts and map, which I won't explain, I told you that you got to look at that one, right? So if you look at your Bible study chart and maps, you know what they said about Phoenicia? Phoenicia, because it's like practically uh, from the land of Canaan, 
That's why it's no surprise that their God, so to speak, their chief gods, you wouldn't guess, Baal, Aristate, Moloch. What are those names for? Nimrod and Semiramis. Aristarte, the female deity, Semiramis, and then the male god, Baal, etc., Nimrod. Phoenicia carried the Babylonian religion. By the way, if you look at Wikipedia about Phoenicia, you know what they said their religion is about Phoenicia? Canaanite religion. Babylon, now use your heads now. If Babylonian religion was carried by Phoenicia or close to where the land of Canaan is, practically in the land of Canaan, Phoenicia's communities are in everywhere, see? So Canaan would, uh, was infected with that as well. Their main cities that you probably heard God constantly judging is Tyre and Sidon. Th those are main cities in Phoenicia because they were covering cities all around the world. Canaan's god was Baal. Now, Nimrod, if he wants to spread his relig religion around the world, what did Satan do? He used merchants from Phoenicia, and then they spread it. As a matter of fact, how did China receive it then? Didn't you know Phoenicia? It is very interesting. This is what Widowson said about Phoenicia. He says this. Traditional historians give the Phoenicians credit for inventing what they spread. Of course, with the alphabet, they also spread child sacrifice along with their mercantile pra practices. Within a century, they would learn to use oared ships and to guide them by the stars to travel great distances with Phoenician coins Phoenician coins even having been found in Brazil. The New World, America. Phoenicia was spreading all around the world. They were spreading Babylonian religion. So here's the thing. There are two ways that Nimrod's system spread. One, which is the most natural common sense, is that everyone was under Nimrod's kingdom before they split, right? They were under Nimrod's kingdom at Babel. Then the Lord judged them, and then they split. So when they split, they carried Nimrod's Babylonian religion with them worldwide, all around the world. But the second thing is that Phoenicia, because they took ba Nimrod's Babylonian religion, they just kept spreading it. And we're going to read later on at Judges. I'm not going to tell you now, but here's a gi giveaway card, okay? And some of you already know this, is that the nation of Israel, their northernmost tribe, is Dan. Now, where is Dan close to then if it's northernmost? Yeah, these guys. So then that's why Dan took the Babylonian religion and then it infected the rest of the nations of Israel. And that's why God, the two tribes that are not mentioned in Revelation 7 are Ephraim and Dan. That's wild. Why do you think God says we're going to go to Canaan? You know why? He's going to wipe, wipe out that mess. He's going to wipe out that mess before they spread further that Babylonian system. Now, I'm going to, oh, I, I have to show you this. Okay, one more verse, one more verse, all right? One more verse. Go to the book of Numbers, and then we're done. Thank you for your patience, but this is the last verse I promise you. We're going to look at the book of Numbers chapter 14. Numbers 14. I have to say this because Egypt and Canaan go hand in hand here. D man, God is so amazing. you got to realize what an amazing time period it was during Moses and the drama that's going on. Go to Numbers chapter 14. Numbers chapter 14, and then we will read verse, uh, let's see over here, uh, 9, verse 9. Numbers chapter 14, verse 9. Okay, now, a lot of you don't know this. The Canaanites, because they're a part of Phoenicia, they were carrying the merchant practices. They spread all around the world. Now look, then they would cover the territory of Egypt, right? Widowson says that Egypt, during that time, was the defense mechanism for Canaan. Why? Because Phoenicians were spreading where? See? So, they need, so obviously they would have Egypt's help as an ally. 
Egypt was the number one world allied power at that time. And the number one spreading the kingdom was Phoenicia, Canaan. You know what God deliberately did? He sent judgment on both. What he did was, I'm going to judge Egypt first so that Canaan can lose its defense. And then it's going to be divide and conquer where they're spreading. All right, now spread out Jews and then conquer it where, they're, where they've infested and corrupted the land. You don't believe me? Look at Numbers chapter 14, uh, verse 9. What did Joshua and Caleb said about the Canaanites? This is what they said about the Canaanites. Verse 9. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land. That's Canaan. For they are bred for us. Why? Why? Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Why do you think when you read the books of Moses that the Canaanites were fearful of the Jews about the parting of the Red Sea? We heard what God did with the land of Egypt. Why do you think they would say that? Because that was their ally. But if you still, uh, here's a better one, okay? Let's just read verse 13. Moses said unto the Lord, then the Egyptians shall hear it. For thou broughtest up this people in thy might from among them. And they, okay, so if God wiped out the Jews, so remember, Moses is trying to appease God's wrath here, all right? Now, I don't have to tell you the story because you listened to your homework assignment on the Adlet commentary, all right? Remember, the Jews, they uh, said, we don't want to go to the land of Egypt. And then God says, okay, I'm going to wipe out the Jews. And Moses is trying to persuade him. Then the Egyptians will what? They will tell it to the what? Inhabitants of this land. The Egyptians are going to tell the Canaanites. How about that? See, there was an ally going on over here. Oh, there was an ally. If God wiped out the Jews, then the Egyptians can tell the Canaanites, hey, there's nothing to fear. It's okay. Their God wiped it out. And Moses' mighty prayer is one of the most famous prayers that changed God's mind. Yeah. And God's like, yeah, you're right. I mean... This Nimrod's Babylon, time has come. Their judgment has come. So yeah, you're right, Moses. Okay, let me get glory so I can wipe them out. I got, now, next discipleship, this is the one that a lot of people might be interested in, but this connects to giants. I'll talk about, remember I mentioned that the giants returned, right? But there's, uh, I'm going to repeat more things about the giants why was Cain, so remember two things what Satan was spreading, the Babylonian religion as well as what? The Genesis 6 civilization. That's why there were giants discovered in Canaan. There, why was the civilization deteriorating? You notice from China's history that civilization is deteriorating, right? Because the giants, the remnant of the celestial gods was deteriorating. Why? God was wiping them out. He was following where the gods were. Why would the gods want to go to Canaan? The remnant of the gods go to Canaan. They want to spread something. So God's like, you're going to go down there. We're going to wipe them all out. And then you're going to find these giant remnants, not just in uh, parts over here where Phoenicia was conquering, but even in China. All right, next week, let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that today's discipleship was a blessing to the hearers. Dismiss us now with your blessing. And I pray that we'll grow more in knowledge of the scriptures. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.